Coming now, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, CEO. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, maybe you need to, sir, um, shift, um, use this um, orange arrow on the webinar console towards the right, right. side, to just to hide it so we can have a full view. Uh, okay. It should not have actually displayed your remote console, but somehow it is. Yeah. That's fine now. That's fine now. Okay. Yes, sir. How so, do we have a full house, so yeah, you can no, normally begin, sir. Okay, thank you. I was Billahi Min Shaitan Ar Rajeem. Bismillahi Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Rabbi Shrah Li Sadri Wa Yassir Li Amri Wa Hal Luqdat Min Lisani Yafqa Qali Rabbi Sadni Ilma. Al Ali, thank you, Ali, and thank you, Mail, for organizing this. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as CEO. Um, very challenging topic for somebody who is not uh, who is sorry, whose native language is not Arabic um, and who who is just aiming who is just aiming to understand what the prophet can offer to the western audiences as well as muslim ceos how we can use uh, teachings from his life to to make our lives better okay um, ali has already introduced me so i i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't go beyond that but i would just like to highlight that our client base is in kuwait bahrain yeah uae saudi uh, my own interest is leadership readiness and bringing God into work. So, inshallah, if Allah, uh, Allah permits me, you will see uh, books like Prophet Muhammad as CEO, Prophet Muhammad as educator, as trainer. So, whatever areas that I work on, I will bring inspiration from Prophet's life and create a model that could be usable for, for everyone. Okay. Um, right. Now, how we can see Prophet's uh, life and, uh, and his CEO role, we can see it from many standpoints. We can see it from independent of any comparison in its own light. For example, how the Prophet did various things. We can also see it in the light of leadership models and theories. Uh, theories like level 5 leadership by Jim Collins or virtuous leadership because there's a lot of emphasis on, on, on that in these current models. We can also see it in response to CEO greed greed and derailment that we see every day today. So we will not sure in, in, in what way we can. So because it's a work in progress, so I, I'll show you how, how it happens. Okay. But this kind of work is not new, particularly from other faiths. So there has been books called Moses as CEO, Jesus as CEO. Uh, what's missing is Prophet Muhammad Wasallam as CEO. And I'm trying. There, I, I, I know that there are many other people who are also working on this topic, but maybe this was available uh, this year, and I gave me this uh, initiation that I could go ahead with this topic. Okay. So if if we see it from uh, other models like virtuous leadership models, um, so there are so these theories, as I already said, are picking up momentum. Jim Collins came up with level five leadership in 2002, and and he first published uh, an article in Harvard Business Review and since that time he has been cited all over. Uh, there has been principle centered leadership, value based leadership, so there are books by these names. So they, they value, they see leader from their trade, uh, from their value based or principle based uh, leadership. We can also see a uh, CEO grade, so we see there's a new scandal, uh, CEO scandal that hits headlines every day. and complete organizations they become casualty. We also see that CEO pay and compensation are a matter of grave concern and considerable debate in North America and Europe, particularly the UK. Um, and we also see that there are models who could be role models at one day, but then they falter tomorrow because there is no morality. Um, Jack Welch could be an example. There are three uh, say, stark examples, particularly when I was growing up as as a professional or as an as an emerging leader, so I remember somebody make commenting when Boris Yeltsin was in Russia and Clinton was in America, and he, and he mentioned both uh, these guys derailments because Clinton's um, relationship with uh, Monica Lewinsky at that time and Boris was always drunk, so he said these are two leaders who are running the two uh, kind of superpowers, but look at their own state. Similarly, Richard Nixon uh, and his book is called Leaders. So Nixon was also a disgraced leader who had to leave uh, 
White House because of the Watergate scandal, because at that time probably I was a journalist. Um, so we see that these people who are uh, who have positions of authority and who are uh, writing books about leaders, but they also have this dif difficulty. But what the prophet did was very interesting. He removed duality in public role and private life. And because his every moment is reported, so we know what he did inside the house with the family, what he also did in, in the business as a singular, for example, trader, but also as a leader. And we know that he was very upfront and he was very honest. There was no, there was no like two lives. So I think that could be first message for many CEOs that removing duality probably is critical. Okay. Similarly, the CEO pay and compensation. So when Allah uh, Subhanahu wa Taala asked the Prophet that if he wants, we can turn uh, Mount Ohad into gold. He he chose Fuqr because he wanted to be ordinary and he lived. He wanted to live with, uh, in in the Fuqr. So I think that was critical that we don't want. And we see examples like uh, today's example, like Steve Jobs. We we know that he only draw probably. Uh, he got no, no salary or maybe uh, one, one dollar. And we also see, for example, Japan Airlines after this uh, Japanese uh, uh, tsunami. Um, and he said, no, we will cut down slash uh, CEO pay. So we see many examples even today uh, that people emulating profits example, not, not really knowing that they are doing that. Okay. But before we talk, let's see in Mahi Zain's video, The Chosen One. I'm really quite a fan of machines. And we can see from uh, 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 Mahi Zain's, and he chose one aspect of Prophet's life. Thank you. 
That was one, one window to Prophet's life. Now let's come back to our main substantive topic, Prophet Muhammad as CEO. So we can see his model maybe at three levels. We can see him at personal leadership level. We can also see him at people leadership, how he led people. We can also see him from task leadership standpoint. Uh, but as I, as I already said, this is work in progress. And future versions may have like four, four levels or maybe two levels or five levels, so I'm not sure how it will evolve, but inshallah will, the aim will be, and I think there will be many questions that will come from you, which will help this model develop uh, a bit better. Okay. So let's look at first leadership, uh, first level, which is personal leadership. In essentially, I think all literature which is like personal, which deals with personal leadership, deals with, uh, with one very important aspect, and that's your credibility and reputation. When you are evolving as a leader, and we see that how the Prophet kept his word, because he was known as Sadiq and Amin, before even he was given uh, the Prophethood, and he was appointed, so he had this reputation, and everybody agreed with that. So what's the message for today's CEOs? Which means as they are growing up, they don't need to cut corners, they, they don't need to, to, to uh, to engage in un, probably unethical, unethical will be a very very huge word. Even those uh, gray shades, I think they need to avoid those 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 elements, uh, which could which could uh, which could come back to haunt you um, when you are uh, when you are appointed as a leader. And we see that many times in in American presidential debates, uh, sorry, presidential races, uh, because when uh, there are, there are many candidates, those when he was those who were growing up, if they have left uh, a loose corner, it comes back to haunt them, even at a very, very uh, serious stage of the, of the leadership pattern. So that's one. Second, how you use your time. Because if you are like, uh, if you don't have focus, if you are collected, if you are doing so many things, if you are uh, uh, fighting many battles, it won't work. So you need to do a fewer things at, at, at those times. You need to self-discipline. You need to probably have good sleep. You need to manage your time very well, and profit did that. And uh, that that and there's one occasion uh, when his early leadership uh, and when he was he didn't have a title when it was established, and that was when all Quraysh Quraysh um, uh, wanted to that who will uh, put Hazratsworth in its place. So he was the first one to arrive, and then he decided what what, what needs to be done. So I think. When uh, leaders manage their time, things can only only help you at that. So this is what this, these are two elements that we can see from his uh, first leadership uh, standpoint. Now let's look at uh, people leadership. There are various elements that I have picked up. For example, communicating. How he will communicate. So his communication was non-hierarchical. He would sit with his sahaba. He would eat with them, and when the Bedouins would come from other places wouldn't know who is the prophet among these. They would come and ask who is Muhammad among these. Person. So they will ask. Which means not from his wardrobe, not the way he stood or he sat. There was no distinctive uh, behavior that people can immediately find out that who is the leader here. So that means when they are, so it's very collegial, it's very uh, non-hierarchical. And he would also use light-hearted humor. Uh, which today's uh, leaders with air, you would, they would say, "Oh, don't use humor because that will undermine your power." Uh, so it's not; it was it wasn't really a power-based uh, dynamism. It was more like um, one of them, one of uh, as we say in English, one of the boys' uh, kind of leadership behavior. So for example, we know this these when people were eating, some were eating dates, and, and profit removed the. Uh, did sparse and he said, "Oh, you have eaten the parse as well." Okay, so that, that that's that that's the communication. How he motivated? So it was usually transformational, not transactional. It was not like you give me your life and I'll give you this. Um, although there was promise of jannah all, all, all over, uh, but because people worked for him and they worked for free and they they did not care about whether they lived or died, 
whether they, there was a risk to their lives, they just believed in, in his mission and he established the can-do approach. So this is how he, he motivated people. How he led, um, we already saw in the Hazrat Surat the episode that he was, uh, he, appeared, he, he was accepted or taken as a leader even without a title. A major element in Indian leadership is how we accept dissent because many leaders, particularly when they are appointed, they may become very autocratic, they may become very authoritative and they may crush any, any dissent that could come from any, any, any sides and sometimes they become quite oppressive. But we see, for example, I would highlight two ex examples, uh, Hazrat Umar's examples during Hudabiyah. I'm sure we will know that, that during uh, Hudabiyah uh, travel, uh, when the Prophet was on uh, Kufar's condition, he said, okay, we are going back, we are not uh, performing Umrah. So he was very vocal and he raised his voice and he said, are we not uh, uh, on the correct path? Are you not the Prophet? Uh, uh, so, so he was very vocal, but he accepted, he didn't, he didn't um, use a harsh voice that Umar, you don't know much or you need to. But he, be, but he, he did that. Uh, similarly, there was a Sahabiya whom he encouraged uh, to, to marry a certain Sahabi, and she said, uh, "Is it um, an advice or an order?" And he said, "It's an, it's an advice." Uh, and she said, "Then I'll prefer not to marry him because of these reasons." And so similarly, so, so, so he, he didn't use his uh, discriminatory, uh, di sorry, discretionary power or the power of power of a leader to push his agenda, he did it. Okay. Emotional question, um, because uh, when, when you are leading people, you also need to be a person with high emotional EQ. So we see from his life that he, 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 was, he persisted, he never lost hope. For example, Taif uh, travels, he didn't curse the people who tortured him. He still hoped that they, yes, one day they will come world. Uh, inshallah. He also didn't ke keep grudges uh, and we saw in Mahir, Zai, Mahir Zain's uh, uh, video that the woman who threw trash, uh, he still went to her when, when she was unwell. Two more examples, forgiving. When, when the mission accomplished, he forgave all at the time of conquest of Makkah, uh, particularly including his sworn enemies. He didn't, do, he didn't, he didn't take any revenge. Also, in terms of how the how the leader unveils their agenda, because when they when the task uh, becomes more complex, when challenges, particularly when values are uh, need to be changed, so he used uh, he used uh, what we uh, what we may call self regulation. So he encouraged people to 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 believe in uh, those values, although they were coming from uh, from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but it, this divine guidance, he introduced them gradually, one one bit at a time, very very carefully, as the acceptance developed. Uh, and, and we could, and we can use that at the time time of target setting, at the time of assigning people complex tasks, how we how we develop their will and skill. So we can use this uh, example from the prophet's life. Work family balance. No job is worth taking. Uh, if, if you have a failed marriage or children are ignored and this is a major issue for most CEOs, particularly most ambitious CEOs. So their children, uh, they, they don't even want to see their dad's faces because he or she or, or, or even mother's faces because they have been so busy in uh, pursuing their ambition, in making money or stakeholder value, whatever you call it. But uh, we see from his uh, prophets example that he created a very fine balance of work, family, personal prayer time. So I, I think that that, that was um, that, that was a very very fine example uh, that, he, that he gave all, all, all leaders. Okay, so these are a few glimpses from how he uh, showed leadership with people. Now let's look at a few task leadership examples. Uh, let's look at uh, first uh, uh, example. Sorry, first area where a leader faces most of his time that's problem solving, and we see that he used uh, timing and he used wise acts. We may call it tactic. Uh, 
so he used those those issues to avoid controversy. And I'll highlight, um, I, I think, at least two examples. One was change of Qibla direction. So it was during the prayer that Allah, Allah uh, uh, guided the Prophet to change Qibla, and he did that. Um, similarly, we had to stay on uh, in Medina on the first night when, when, when because everybody wanted that this uh, blessing should, should be theirs. So Prophet used uh, the very level uh, his camel we would uh, we would um, take rest. That would be the place where he, he would stay. Uh, he also allowed people to use their own ways in worldly matters. For example, when Prophet came from Makkah to Medina, uh, people were usually they would cross match their uh, trees at, uh, for for the date crop. And Prophet thought that this was maybe uh, maybe a shirk or some sort of uh, so. The Prophet prohibited people to do that, and the next year there wasn't uh, enough uh, crop. So he asked, "What happened?" And they said, "Because when we will make them, so there will be larger quantities of uh, crop, and because you stopped us, that's why it didn't happen." So then he used the word that I am here to teach you uh, the Deen affairs, and you can use your discretion in your. Uh, in your worldly affairs. So I think that was remarkable that you allow people to use their own discretion and their own experience, past experience, to do things in their own way. Okay. Uh, decision making, and I, I, I added a word called consultative or participative decision making. So there's a hadith which is called who consults does not get embarrassed. Um, um, now it's very interesting because I have I, I have pondered over this. He didn't say that those who consult they will get the right decisions to make, or it will be very timely decisions. It just means they wouldn't be they, they wouldn't feel ashamed or they wouldn't be made embarrassed. Why? Because when you consult everybody, they're on board. They they have a buy-in, and I think that's that's critical job for leaders. So even as CEO, when you are running your senior management team. So and you have all the wisdom. You still don't uh, rule it out. You you ask people what they think uh, needs to be done here. And 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 in in general in in uh, leadership we, in these leadership uh, workshops we we uh, we tell these CEOs that even if you know the answer, don't give it. Let them come up with that answer. So you need to engineer that conversation that they come up with an answer. Um, so I, I think that's, that that could be a very good example. And another example could be from Khandak Matter. Uh, it was participative decision making. And interesting thing is that the that the uh, the strategy or, or um, this uh, digging uh, uh, digging uh, and digging uh, Khandak that came from an Ajmi, not an Arabi. So which means there was also acceptance of diversity. That other people's ideas are as welcome as as their own, own ideas. Now, when one very interesting thing, and particularly for male CEOs, uh, they think that the business or corporates are their domain, and the probably wives don't know. Um, similarly, business uh, or money it is not really the, the card. But we see from uh, Hudaybiyah again, again Hudaybiyah, an example from Hudaybiyah. When the Prophet decided that we will go back from here, so he asked the Sahaba to, to drop their ihram and convert it to other, other clothes. And, and the, the Sahaba didn't do that. So he came inside and he spoke to his wife, who was with him during this uh, travel. And he said to her that uh, people are not doing what I'm saying. And she says, you don't need to say you're a Prophet. You just go and do it. People will follow you. And he did that. So he just came outside, he dropped in his, his arm and, and changed clothes. So I, I think the counsel from somebody who is not, uh, who's not exposed to states manship still can give you a life-changing uh, counsel and advice. So that's critical that we, we listen to all these ideas. And to bring in training, I think in, in West it's very fashion to say don't give fish, yeah, help you teach people how to fish. 
And I think there's a very good example uh, of a man who came to the Prophet seeking arms, but he, he asked him if he has something that you can sell. And I'm sure you, we all know this hadith. Okay, so he got two uh, two uh, coins, and then he asked him to one to use for his family for food, and the other to buy an axe and then start uh, start his his work. And he did that. Uh, so also it is important that we do not offer solutions that that make them addicted to you. So addicted to our own wisdom probably is not a good thing. So we need to encourage people to find answers themselves. We just need to start a thinking process in them. Let's look at um, uh, an organization like Cycle. So let's start from allocating work. He only had 23 years to develop a team. He used what we call strength-based assigning because there's a lot of work which particularly Caleb is doing in recent years in, in, in this decade. So with Marcus Buckingham's book, now discover your strengths and his deputy. He was then deputy Tom Rath's strengths-based leadership which just came a couple of years ago. So we see there's a lot of focus which is away from being instead of an all-rounder all kind of semi-perfect leader, we are seeing there's somebody who has a strength, and even if it's a micro step in any area, a leader uses that, builds on it, and then gets the results that the team needs or desires. So this is what the Prophet he did. He picked what, what, what was best in people, and he created the best job person fit. And that was based on their capability, not just capability, but also preference, because you would ask people when people would convert, or when people would be captured. So according to their ability and their preference, you would ask what you want to do. And this is how people were assigned to write wahi, or they were assigned to teach, or they were assigned a negotiating role, or they were sent as MSPs and boys. So this is how Prophet so, so he did that. Delegating, um, very interesting. Um, uh, he would also do, do that, again, according to people's um, capability. For example, we see that during Hijrat, he assigned his Hasdari Radhi to stay back and he asked the Hasdari worker to accompany. So that was a decision that most leaders make. Who do I pick for which task? Um, and he would also appoint, uh, appoint for potential, although that should come in the, in, in the, in the real slide. Okay, for example, Hasdari Radhi Radhi when the Khabar uh, expedition was being um, arranged, and Prophet announced tomorrow uh, to, to all Sabah, tomorrow I'm going to give somebody, uh, somebody the task of uh, Handak, uh, sorry, Khabar, uh, somebody that, uh, with whom Allah and his Prophet is pleased, and who is pleased with uh, Allah and his Prophet. And uh, the, the, in Hadith, there's, there's this uh, explanation that Hastumar said, I, I usually wouldn't pray for any, anything, but that night, all night I prayed that this is assigned to me, because there was such a big pride that Allah is pleased with that, that individual and his prophet is pleased. But then next day, as Ali was called in, he was unwell, um, but Prophet Muslim, he still gave him this expedition. So that was his potential and that encouraged uh, the prophet, uh, sorry, that, that became the cause of, his, of, of, of this task. So that was delegating. Let's look at how he trained people. Now, very interesting because um, I, I run this country's longest running train the trainer workshops. This is much in, in, in its 13th year now. At least 1,000 trainers have gone through these workshops in 16 or 17 plus Asian locations. And, and we see that West is now talking about bite size learning because they realize that attention spans are very low, particularly Gen Y, and they can't take very longish um, messages. So we need to move on to bite-sized learning. And the Prophet gave us as, as an example of bite-sized learning. So if we see most ahadith, they are very small, half-liner, one-liner, or maybe maybe two or three-liner, one paragraph, but hardly longish than that. So very rarely there will be ahadith which are longish. So he used those bite-sized learnings. And one very pertinent method that he used, which is called a constructivist um, uh, theory, and that is you ask questions instead of telling them. And he would always ask questions, do you know who is what? So, so, so 
that was his way how he will warm up people's minds or Sahaba's minds before he, he gave them something. Um, he would use his stories and I recently, I, I'm reading a lot of literature recently which is pointing to this, that all future training will be through storytelling, including Howard's book. Um, in, in fact, there, there, there's a lot of uh, sales literature which is coming, all future selling will be through storytelling as opposed to say, just telling the benefits or features or, or just uh, highlighting them. So, so short stories and anecdotes and either anecdotes from your own personal life or from, from the past, they are becoming a significant uh, method in order to train people and he used that. He also used demonstration, for example, after one prayer he took out the Sahaba and they all walked with him. So un until they all went out of Medina boundary and then he saw a small animal, uh, a goat, which, had, which was already dead and it was smelly. So the Prophet said, is there anyone who, who, could, who could buy this uh, uh, for any, any amount? And, and the Sahaba said, who could buy this uh, animal? It's already dead, no use, it's smelly. Uh, so who would buy this? And, and the Prophet said, that in Allah's eyes, uh, the world is uh, the world is no better than this uh, dead uh, goat. So this is uh, like what we call a demonstration effect, because people don't forget that. When and when I uh, read this hadith, I, I realized this prophet could have have done that just after, for example, that prayer. He could have said. Uh, in very simple narrative terms, that this is what uh, life, uh, the world, the world is in in, in Allah's eyes. No, but he used that in order to establish that meaning. He also did not embarrass anyone. So, for example, if we to say today's uh, management meeting, so no blames, and if people are making mistakes, so people are not being picked up. Also, in training, we saw today's trainers; they are picking up on people, joking. Um, so he wouldn't do that. So even if he had to train people by using, and if he see somebody doing a wrong thing, maybe not practicing the right manner, he would just tell them in general. So the person would get a message that it was aimed at me, but it would also be for everyone else. And the moral is, do not embarrass anyone. He will also not overload. So again, through bite-sized learning, as well as stopping at a time when people's, uh, people's ability to take information may, may uh, diminish the stop. And I, I may mention that I'm also working on this book, The Prophet Muslim as Trainer. I gave a talk on this uh, in, in Kuwait last year when I was there to a group of um, uh, Kuwaitis who were American PhDs and American MBAs and American engineers. So it went really well and they encouraged me to work on this. Okay. Next, a prison. Um, Hazrat who worked with him and he said after 10 years of serving uh, and he, he gives an example that the Prophet did not penalize me after a mistake was made. Now this element after, I think that's critical because generally a uh, lot of literature which is because I'm also working on this appraisal, particularly why appraisal is a bad news because I'm proponent that we need to get rid of appraisal, performance appraisals. We don't know what will replace them. Uh, because there are many people in the world who are working on them, and I'm uh, on that, and I'm one of those academics. Um, because this looks at your past performance, which means any lessons that you could draw from a past year's performance probably won't hold uh, or won't be any useful for, for pe people who are going to use them in the future. So I, I, see, I think we see a very good example from the Prophet's life that he wouldn't do that, he wouldn't penalize, he wouldn't blame after that. So let's look at succession management as well. He has a, he had a pipeline which he built uh, and he trained these uh, brilliant Khalifas for uh, Khulafai Rajneen who would carry his, his mission after and each one of them got a different kind of training from him uh, and, and, they, and again they, they, they had their own strengths through which they, they carried on their, their missions. So we cannot see that there was an overlap uh, of, of leadership. So they all had some probably uh, similar uh, attributes, similar uh, 
uh, strengths, but they also had clear uh, ways to carry the profit's mission. So this was he, he also did that. Now the final question, what's in it for us? Um, so we can see from these examples that there's nothing superhuman here. All those things, all these uh, things that we, we see at three levels, personal leadership, people leadership, and task leadership. These are things that we, they are very practical, they are very much doable. Any CEO who can create a model can do that, and there's no element of an overload that or, or superhuman being, we don't need to. I think uh, with our imperfect uh, lives, with our imperfect uh, uh, work-life balance, we can still achieve, or at least aim to achieve them. All we need to do is, we need to develop some clarity how we did that, what was his sunnah, what was his iswa, and I'm sure we can do them, use them in our daily work life. But the question is, will the CEOs, when they are faced with a challenge, will they consider how the prophet handled this challenge, how he passed through this issue, how he hired people, or how he trained them, or how he evaluated them. That's a question that CEOs need to ask, maybe from this day onwards, after we have gone through this task. So I think that would be uh, critical. And um, that's that's about it. Um, so, so I think Fibur uh, is open. I'm sure he has his job. Uh, I think over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Zahid. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zahid. Uh, Mr. Zahid, you might have to. Uh, I'm hearing my echo through your audio. So if you can put a headphone, maybe. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, folks, if you have a question, you could um, either raise your hand. There's a hand icon on your webinar console, and I'll be able to give you an opportunity to speak to Mr. Zahid. Or you could equally put your questions uh, in the chat box or question box, and I'll be happy to read them over on your behalf. So if you have a question, you feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I see a couple of hands uh, have been already raised, so let me see one by one. Uh, Mr. Abdul Qadir Bazara, uh, Mr. Bazara, can you hear us? Uh, do you have a question, sir? Um, I, I think what I heard that you do not have a question, that was by mistake. Okay. Uh, let's move uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, we have a gentleman, Mr. Uh, Mr. Atahur Rahman. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Rahman. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as-salam. Mr. Rahman, could you please introduce yourself and ask the question? Mr. Wali, Wali, Mr. Wali, guys, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, brother, my, my question is about a term uh, which you, you have used, bite-sized learning. Can you, uh, would you, would you like to explain this? Bite-sized learning. Okay. 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 Thank you. Generally, but we when we say bite-sized learning, it means it's a very, um, bite is like a small bite, just like we eat food, so it's like a bite, which means it's a very small portion, so which you can finish maybe in one minute or maybe in two minutes. So for example, something on decision making, so if there's a bite-sized learning module, which means there is probably a one paragraph on in making maybe the best practice or maybe a short very short two or three line case study and probably there is um, a short video clip maybe 30 second clip or maybe one question so that will constitute what is bite size learning and you can also google it later after we are done with this so it will give you 
what it what what constitutes. Okay, next. Next question. Much. I'm going to move to another uh, person, Mr. Faisal Tahir Khan. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear us? Could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Hello, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Yes, Faisal. Could you please introduce and where are you calling from? And please, um, could you please ask a question? Yeah. Uh, my name is Faisal. Uh, my name is Faisal Tahir. I'm one of the uh, young people in oil last year. And my question is specifically uh, regarding corporate uh, governance in uh, uh, reference to Prophet Muhammad's life. That at times we see in our part of the world that certain corporate decisions uh, on let's say a board of directors of eight or let's say seven or twelve people decide something, uh, let's say on a majority, but the dissenting people are uh, having some views which are quite close to Islam or I must say the teaching of Prophet Muhammad uh, whether uh, it is fundraising or whether it is a new venture or whatever, whatever uh, the structure it may be. So my question is uh, but at time if the other both structure although Muslims not following the principles of Prophet Muhammad you have to be alienated in that both structure because you might be using in your way an ethical way but others are following for example profit maximization principle uh, uh, not uh, 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 realizing that they might be going away from the teaching of Islam. So in such, such circumstances what would be your advice to those individual or member of the board or perhaps the CEO uh, who have to take tough decision in the pressure of investors or perhaps in the uh, uh, especially investors or, the, or shareholders uh, which are only driven by profit maximization even to compromise certain ethical do should they put their foot down or should they take a stand and let's see whatever the consequences would maybe thank you okay thank, thank you brother uh, I think it will be it will be very easy if we follow the prophet sunnah because one your risk is already predestined so which means whether you take a stand or if you don't take a stand, it would not really hurt what's already destined for you in terms of your money, in terms of position. Now we also see in corporate governance terms, for example if we take example from America, that people would use, the board would push a certain way. So sooner or later, um, they, 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 are, they are bound to face those consequences of uh, those unwise decisions and, and we see that every day because there's a new uh, game changing rules just because somebody has been too pushy or too ambitious or too greedy. So which means whether these are secular boards or whether these are Muslim boards, if there's somebody who is uh, going beyond a certain line, one uh, sooner or later they are going to face the So that's one. So it's better to put the foot down now. There are two options. One, you need to be vocal because most of the time somebody who knows what's right for them because of under group think or under group pressure, peer pressure, they are unable to highlight their opinion because they don't have that kind of self-confidence uh, and the confidence in their own opinion. So I think a, a good CEO who follows the prophet's example, one, they need to develop that courage to raise voice whenever they see that we are crossing the line. So that's one. Okay, and so that, that's one route. Another route could be that you walk away, you move, move on. Because if you leave this, I'm sure there is something else that Allah has, has created for you which is waiting for you. So go to that place where you can use probably with more, uh, you can use more discretion and more Sharia compliant uh, behavior. Um, so my advice would be that there's no there's no loss making proposition if you follow the prophet's example and if you have this tawakkal in Allah that He is the giver of this risk because Allah clearly says that no harm can come to you if I don't want and if the whole world wants and um, 
no uh, good thing can come to you if I don't want any of the whole world, world sports. So I think there's a great clarity that Allah and his prophet has given us in what to do in these issues uh, of, of maybe gray shades. I don't know whether I have answered or not. No, thank you very much. Thank very kind of you. Next. Well, thank you, thank you, Faisal. Uh, yeah. Let's move to the, another one. Uh, I for Ms. Aisha Ahmed. Can you hear us? Ms. Aisha Ahmed. Uh, okay, let me move to another one, I believe. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Elias Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear us? Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Mr. Muhammad, you can please uh, introduce yourself where you're calling from and please ask a question. Uh, I have a question that the present age is very specialist. Uh, your presentation uh, is not uh, very much clear about uh, uh, we are dealing CEO uh, with economic perspective, social perspective, and political perspective. So there is uh, mixing. Uh, uh, I, I feel. Could you explain me this thing? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because if we take the prophet's uh, life a a as a seeda, there are so many aspects that we need to speak about. Uh, so similarly, CEO's role in probably branding, in marketing, in also how he manages finance, also in terms of stakeholder um, value, all of these things can be covered in, in, in a model which is very comprehensive and which is very holistic. I've just taken one example of Prophet's life and that's the, the people dimension aspect how he assigns tasks to people, how he deals their motivational aspects of their engagement levels, and how he demonstrates his own. So it's a very, very narrow area. So I'm not aiming uh, to cover all aspects. It's a very narrow area. Well, thank you. Yes, Mr. Mohan, I think uh, considering we had only 30 minutes for the presentation, so it had to be a very uh, broader level presentation. Uh, let's move to the chat box. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mrs. Aisha Amir. She only raised her hand, but she has posted. Mr. Wali, uh, sir, can you please tell me or tell us more on your point of penalizing? I think she's mentioning about the appraisal system that you want. Okay. Right. Um, as I highlighted, a word called after a mistake has been made. So most managers, leaders, or CEOs, they love to criticize people after they have made a mistake because that satisfies their own ego that puts them a level above on the staff who has made made these mistakes and they get a bit of patronizing a bit of to show patronizing behavior so typical CEO behavior now what we see from the prophet's life was this that do not pick people after they have made a mistake which means you you can guide them, you can coach them, you can train them uh, before the task is assigned. But once a mistake has been made, probably you can live with that. And that's all right. I, I have another model, maybe inshallah at some stage, uh, and because this is review level, so I'm, I'm happy, happy that. So maybe in another review level or in any other month, we can also look at this. Um, well, it's four T's for leaders. So f these are four tolerances, and I'll just highlight. So they tolerate mistakes, they tolerate failure, they tolerate dissent, um, and they tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty. Most CEOs probably wouldn't want to do that because they want they are very evidence based. They want concrete results, and they they don't want failure because they think they have spent money, they have spent so much energies. So what the prophet's life would tell them that mistakes will be made and there will be fatal mistakes. So we will lose lives, we will lose uh, important uh, important benchmarks. But that's all right. That's part of life. Hope Aisha I have I have conveyed. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, um, okay, next question from uh, 
brother Mustafa Abu Rad. Uh, one major leadership trait is not waiting for remuneration, rather looking for the end result and how it helps others and society. It is there in our religion uh, and an example would be appreciated. Okay. So, uh, if, I, if I correctly hear, it's a uh, ends versus mean discussion? Yes. Yeah. So, you look at the end result rather yes. than the means yes. part or or you look at, you start with end in mind, that, that kind of thing? Yes, looking for the end result in mind. Okay. So, I think Prophet's life uh, is a very good example. Um, so, if we see that his life mission was to tell the world that there is only one Allah, that was his life mission, and everything else was part of that process. So, for example, how he was given the prophethood, and then how he spent those three years in uh, Hira uh, cave, and how he, for example, how he started from a very low key uh, tabligh at the start, and then he how he spread and how he gained power. So all all this is, this was part of the process. But the end was when he goes from this life, his mission. So the uh, the uh, the conquest of Makkah, that that was probably that he that his mission was. So similarly, um, now. I would also think at another level, even conquest of Makkah will, probably was also part of the process. Why? Because a Mumin or a Muslim CEO's uh, the real life goal would be to please Allah. So which means whatever you do in this life is to please Allah and to gain a place in heaven. So he did that and his uh, Sahaba did that and all these CEOs who want to uh, gain Allah's pleasure, they also need to do that. So business is part of the process. So the money which you get is only a byproduct because you are pleasing Allah as you are making money. So I don't know whether that's that's a good example or not. This is how we see our lives, so our life goals. That end result is that when we leave the world, Allah is pleased with us and Allah's um, uh, creation, which means both the triple bottom line, which means the environment, and the people that we are dealing with and every business, they all are, there's all, there's all a happy ending. Next question. Okay, um, there's a supplementary to the same end result question, interesting, from Tasmi Akhtar. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had his set of tests and trials, yet the end was not unknown. He was the last prophet and he knew the end in this world and world hereafter. Where are unknown to ordinary people, which are unknown to ordinary people. So how can a CEO today fill that gap? Being blind about the end result may be a big test of one's nerves. Okay. Right. Okay. What, what Allah's Sunnah is, this name that uh, your destiny is not uh, made clear to you it evolves. So you discover it one step at a time. So you go to the next step and then you realize, okay, this is what is in store for me. This is how it happens. Which means probably we need to go through that that, <clears throat> that process. There's no shortcut. You cannot forecast uh, your life. You cannot forecast your, your uh, successes or failures. And particularly in today's examples, I think we can see fate of Nokia, fate of uh, HP, fate of Sony. None of them would have even imagined that they were going away, they were dying uh, companies, maybe two or three years from uh, ago. So which means it will evolve and we need to, to, we need to face, with, uh, face that. That's part of our job. That comes with the territory as they say. Hey, uh, another one from uh, hey, uh, Naveed Sakra. Do you have an example from Popper's life about handling organizational politics, which is very common in most organizations? Right. Okay. I, I think um, his organization politics was use of transparency because there is one, there's a fair play and then there's a power play. 
power play means that you conspire, you have these drawing room politics, and, and before you go to a formal meeting, you actually pre-decides all things. So there's lots of uh, behind the scene maneuvers. That's a power play. But transparent play is you actually do it there and then. Uh, um, so I think what we see is transparency. And he also created trust, not just uh, 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 Sahaba's trust on him, he also developed trust on each other. So which means he would bond people with each other. He would make collaborative teams. Um, and he used what we today in today's world, what we can call uh, the peer pressure or peer learning or peer, um, uh, okay, so, so basically you, you, use, uh, you use peers for each other's development and each other to, to, to achieve objectives and he did that. And if a leader does that, he doesn't need to be afraid how people are going to target him or how people are going to target each other. Also, he was very mindful about those things, this envy and jealousy, he knew that this would happen um, and, and he, he knew how to, how to deal with that. Um, so so I, I think today's CEOs will also need to know. So one, one uh, politics that, that are aimed at you, so he, this is how he dealt with that trust in, in, through transparency. And one or this politics which were aimed at, at each other. So he would, he would use, uh, he would use uh, fact, fact finding to if, if, if there was something and he would want to find out what's happening with that Sahaba. And, and creating a bond. So, so I, I think this is how he did that. Okay. Uh, uh, Ali, I'm just mindful that our hour has finished. Yeah. Do we need to me, carry on or uh, shall, shall we? Yeah. I'll just try to take a last question. Uh, There's another hand raised. So let's take it and then we'll conclude. Uh, Mr. Asif Iqbal. You've raised your hand, sir. You have a question? Hello, Mr. Asif Iqbal. Uh, yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, we can hear you. And where are you calling from? And please ask the question. Uh, I am from uh, Federal Urdu University, Islamabad. I am doing MPhil in uh, general management. So I have a question with uh, Wali. So uh, it's the uh, comparison. We can comparison of any superhuman with. Uh, other humans, so how we can define the superhuman? Okay, so I think you are referring to the word that I use, superhuman being? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay, what, what I wanted was to emphasize that Prophet, when he led the team, it was not an act of superhuman being. It was an act of human being just like anybody else. So which means the Prophet's Uswa is not only for those um, gifted individuals, as, as we call gifted individuals, in, in, or for example gifted leaders. So it's for all of us. All of us can do. So that's why I emphasize. So it was not um, a human versus a superhuman being. It, it was to highlight that we all can. I don't know whether that satisfies or not. I don't have an example of a superhuman being. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Iqbal, if you're satisfied, we can move uh, and conclude. Oh, uh, for example, uh, uh, um, sorry, yeah. Ali, maybe I'm cutting it. For example, we can see Steve Jobs today. So Steve Jobs in his ex life, first he impacted the computing. He changed everything about computing when he brought Apple. Then he changed um, his, uh, phone, 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 use of phone when he brought these touch phones for example, um, and he changed the whole uh, phone, uh, telephony. Now, um, important thing is, I would tell people that he, he, he was as ordinary as all of us are. It, it was not because of his, that he was a genius, that he, he was so superhuman being. He was like anybody. So anybody who wants to impact the world in the way he did, they can do some certain things and they can achieve those uh, things pretty much in the same way as Steve Jobs did. Okay. Yes, Ali. 
Okay, um, I think this we can take just one last and then conclude a short one uh, from Brother Azhar. Um, isn't Prophet, peace be upon him, um, uh, be considered a CEO on all worldly matters rather than just being? Okay. Um, I, I think we, uh, there, there's plenty of uh, Sira books on that, which is that he is an example for everything in this world. So whether that's your private life, whether that's your business, whether that's your military expeditions, and whether as a husband, as a father. So he is uh, Uswai Hasana in every matter related to a human's life. So which means, um, he, yes, he is a big us, uh, us, Uswa uh, um, in, in all matters, so no doubt about it. And my, my job is only to look at, at this aspect, particularly in this, this uh, webinar. Okay. Well, uh, I think that brings towards the end of the webinar. Uh, Mr. Zahid, uh, we would like to thank you on behalf of Mail uh, for your time and sharing this uh, uh, a very uh, spiritually lifted uh, presentation. Um, uh, once again, thank you very much. And we would like to thank all of you who participated in this webinar and um, helped us to make it interactive. Um, we shall be coming up with a more series of webinars uh, to keep our spiritual quotient high. Uh, meanwhile, you can always uh, visit our website www.mile.com org to learn more about our upcoming programs and webinars. Uh, there are lots of uh, questions regarding um, the recorded version and soft copy presentation of this webinar, which we shall be sharing. It will take us a couple of days to just to render and record and upload on our blog and YouTube, and we shall definitely revert back to you guys with the link. Uh, once again, Mr. Zahid, thank That's you very much for your time. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Um, now I